Hey guys, so we are about to finish up chapter 14 um, and we are going to learn today about where William is now starting school. Now remember, he's going to a boarding school, which means that he's sleeping there because it's an hour bus ride. Um, so it's not walking distance like his old school. So that's one big difference. And we're also going to learn about some other differences. Some things that are really good, like you think at first, oh great, this is a much better school, but then some things are also some struggles that the school still has. So um, keep, keep listening for differences between this school and his other experiences in school. The first one is the very first sentence and it's a big difference. The classrooms in Medici had solid roofs that didn't leak and smooth, unblemished concrete floors. Large windows let in sunshine, but kept out the cold. I had an actual desk of my own, complete with a pencil holder. During study sessions at night, real fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, or at least they did when there wasn't a blackout. Science class was held in an actual chemistry lab where the shelves were lined with microscopes, giant coils of high resistant wire, glass beakers, and old jars of boric acid. If you can believe it, one of the first lessons in science class was how current passes through an electric bell. I had already applied this concept with my windmill and circuit breaker, but hearing it explained in scientific terms and in English was like hearing it for the first time. But like every other school in Malawi, Mala Medici relied on the government to survive. So we heard about some good things. We've got solid roofs, desks, pencils, books, lights. Remember, in his old school, he was sitting out under the trees. There were holes in the roof, letting the rain in. It was cold. So we already have some good things, but now we're going to hear about some challenges. Like every other school in Malawi, Medici relied on the government to survive. Unlike some of the more prestigious schools that got, for, that got funding, this one had been forgotten. Most of the equipment in the science lab was old and no longer worked. The chemicals had expired and were dangerous. The microscopes were rusted and scratched. For the electric bell lecture, we had no batteries to supply the power. If anyone has an extra one in their rooms, I'm happy to demonstrate, the teacher said. No one did, so we used our imaginations. Our dorms were also dirty and the walls were covered with graffiti. The bathroom didn't always work, so the new students, namely me, had to clean them every day to keep down the smell. The rooms themselves were so cramped that we each had to share our bed with another boy. My bedmate was a guy named Kennedy who never cleaned his socks. Hey man, you need to wash your feet before you come into bed, I told him. Sorry, I can't ever tell, he said. I'll wash them tomorrow, promise. But he never did. Often I'd wake up with his feet touching my mouth. And because I was years older than everyone else, some of the students teased me. They shouted, how many kids did you leave behind at the farm, old man? Two boys, I said, and one more on the way, perhaps next month. He doesn't really have any kids, right? He thinks he's funny, they said. He's spending too much time with his cows. One day, I decided to end the teasing once and for all. I pulled out the newspaper article about my windmill and slapped it down on the table. Here, I said, this is what I was doing. My dorm mates were impressed. Good job, man, they said. No one teased me after that. Honestly, it really didn't bother me because after five years of being a dropout, I was grateful to be in school. However, I did become homesick and whenever that happened, I'd hide away in the school library where the books filled rows and rows of shelves. I'd find a chair and study my lesson books in geography, social studies, biology, and math. I'd lose myself in American and African history and within the colorful maps of the world. No matter how foreign and lonely the world was outside, the books always reminded me of home sitting under the mango tree. While I attended school at Medici, Dr. McKazine was busy making arrangements for Arusha. He helped get me a passport and even took a collection for a new white shirt and black trousers. So again, Dr. McKazine, major player here. He took up, he got him noticed because he had the, um, he got him interviews with newspapers and with um, radio. He helped pay for his first semester at school and now he's helping him get to the TED conference and he bought him a new outfit for that. They were the nicest clothes I'd ever owned. He also gave me useful travel advice. Think about it, he's never traveled anywhere and not only has he never traveled anywhere because maybe you've never taken an airplane ride somewhere, but you've probably seen it on a show or in a movie and you kind of know what to expect, right? 
he doesn't have any context for how to travel that way or how to go on an airplane or what to expect. No context at all. He gave me useful travel advice. For instance, on a plane, I'd be assigned a seat that was mine and mine only. There was no need to rush and use your elbows like people did on Malawian buses. Also, if the red light was on near the bathroom, that meant it was occupied. And because some passengers became nauseous on their first plane ride, each seat came with a paper bag for vomit. This was good information because I was certain I would need it. In June, I left school and came home to pack. The next morning, a driver appeared to take me to the airport in the long way. Our son is leaving us and traveling by airplane, my father told my mother, smiling. That's right, I said, flying like a bird in the sky. I'll be waving as I pass over. We'll be watching for you. You'll see us here. My father tucked a bag of roasted peanuts in my pocket. They were still warm. That evening, I was so nervous, I stayed awake in my hotel room watching soccer on Super Sport 3 until the sun came up and it was time to leave. On the plane, I couldn't believe it, but sitting next to me was none other than Soyapi Mumba, the software engineer from Malangwe who'd first seen my article. Because he's a nice guy, he introduced himself, not knowing who I was. When I told him my name and where I was going, he replied, oh my gosh, William the windmill guy? He explained how excited he was to show the story to Mike McKay, who'd then blogged about me on Hacktivate. So Yappy was the very reason anybody had ever heard of me. And now here he was sitting next to me on the plane. It also happened that Soyapi was a TED fellow himself being honored for his coding work with Baobab. I was so fortunate to find him. As the plane taxied toward the runway, I began to notice others seated around me. They looked so well-dressed and confident like they had important things to do and their busy lives required them to travel in jets across the world. As the plane accelerated and lifted its nose in the air, I pressed my head back against the seat and laughed. I now was one of them too. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start chapter 15 because we have a couple more minutes together, so hang in there. After, this is called Meeting Ted and Tom. After arriving in Arusha, I boarded a bus to Ningardodo Mountain Lodge where the conference was being held. As the bus exited the airport, I gazed out the window to see if Tanzania looked any different from Malawi, but what I saw was very similar. The highway was filled with minibuses crammed with people. A giant lorry belched smoke and swerved to miss an old man on a bicycle. There were children in rags hawking cigarettes on the roadside, while students in bright uniforms marched through the dust to school. I saw village women balancing loads of vegetables on their head and farmers tending to their fields. But unlike Malawi, Arusha had trees. And not only that, after some minutes, the shutter, shuttle, driver, shuttle driver pointed off in the distance and said, look there, Kilimanjaro, biggest mountain in Africa. Mount Kilimanjaro appeared even more grand and majestic than I'd seen in books, with ribbons of white snow along its peak and cloaked in a thin layer of clouds. It was hard to imagine that ordinary people like myself actually climbed to the top, but I knew they did. In my head, I began making a list of all the other places in the world I wanted to see. That mountain filled me with great confidence, but it all seemed to vanish once I reached the hotel. The lobby was a scene of chaos and confusion, filled with people speaking English and Africans with strange and foreign accents. Everyone was chatting on their mobile phones and talking in loud, booming voices. I prayed that no one would speak to me, and after registering at the Welcome Center, I walked to a corner of the room and tried to disappear. No such luck. After some minutes, a man walked up and stuck out his hand. He had red hair and wore purple and green eyeglasses. Hello, welcome to TED, he said. My name is Tom, who are you? I'd practiced only one line of English, so I let it fly. I'm William Kamkwamba and I'm from Malawi. He stared at me strangely. Maybe I'd said it in Chichua? Wait a minute, he said. You're the guy with the windmill. Tom, this guy he's meeting, was in charge of organizing all the corporate sponsors at TED, including the ones who'd paid for my airfare and hotel. Months earlier in New York, Amika, the Nigerian blogger, had told Tom about my windmill saying, you'll never believe this story. But Tom didn't know that Amika had then searched under every rock in Malawi to find me. After talking a while, Tom asked if I wanted to tell my story on stage in front of all these people. I shrugged. Why not? Do you have a computer, he asked. I shook my head. Do you have any photos of the windmill? 
I did have these. A friend of Dr. McKazian's had visited Medici a few weeks earlier and helped prepare a presentation in case I needed it. He'd done this on his laptop, though at the time I had no idea that that was a computer. To me, computers were big, like televisions, and had to be plugged into the wall. Before the man left, he handed me a strange cube, a flash drive, attached to a rope, and said, wear this around your neck. This is your presentation. So when Tom asked about my photos, I handed him the cube. He then plugged it into another laptop and said, I'll just copy these onto my computer. It was then that I realized what a laptop was. Of course, I thought, it's a portable computer. What a good idea. Sensing my delight at this discovery, Tom asked me, William, have you ever seen the internet? The what? No, I said. In a quiet conference room, Tom sat me down and introduced me to the most amazing tool. This is Google, he said. You can find answers to anything. What do you want to search for? That was easy. Windmill. In one second, he pulled up five million page results, pictures and pictures and models of windmills I'd never even imagined. My God, I thought, where was this Google when I needed it? Then we pulled up a map of Malawi and then a photo of Wambe itself taken in outer space. It's funny to me now at this conference in East Africa with some of the world's greatest innovators of science and technology just outside the door, there I was sitting in the room seeing the internet for the first time. Okay, so we are going to stop there. Go ahead and go into Google Classroom and answer those questions for us. Have a great day.